first of all, thank you so much for coming tonight. We put on this program for um, our volunteers and our members of Mississippi Park Connection. And some of you are both of those things. And so it's a very special crowd tonight. We're really excited to do this um, show for you tonight. And um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for supporting all of our programs and supporting the park and supporting our mission. And um, I think it's gonna be super fun. We had over 200 people registered tonight. So apparently talking about crows is very, very popular. And I think it's gonna be a good time. Um, I think that's it. I'll let Ranger Sharon take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Callie. Uh, and yes, thank you everyone for signing up for a crow program on a, on a Friday night. Uh, I, I honestly thought that we would get maybe 50 people top signing up for this. So I was pretty excited when I saw the registration. It makes me super incredibly happy that a bird that is fairly common uh, gets this much attention. So uh, I'm just gonna preface this by saying I'm, I'm definitely a bird expert. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I wouldn't say I'm the world's authority on crows, but I know quite a bit. But I will say, one of the things that's amazing about crows is how much we don't know. Uh, and we learn new things all the time. So the information I'm going to give you now is based on the best information that we, we have at the moment, but it could be five years from now. Uh, the, this information may be different. So uh, I do want to encourage people to ask questions. Uh, you, you don't have to ask them in the chat. We, there's a Q&A feature on uh, the screen. If you click that, you can type in your question and Callie will be monitoring the chat. So first things first, since we're gonna be talking about uh, crows, let me get to my slides. Why murder? Well, murder is the collective name for crows. Uh, they're, they're collective nouns for all sorts of birds. Um, one of my favorites is for uh, a grouping of owls because long-eared owls will roost together and they're called a parliament of owls. Uh, if you watch Coffee with a Ranger this morning, we learned uh, that turkeys, it's a, it's a rafter of turkeys. And for crows, it's a murder of crows. Now, I'm just going to give a pro tip out there to anyone who knows a birder and happens to see this meme that has been around on the internet for years. Don't send this to your birding friends. Uh, <laughs> I know it's cute. It says attempted murder, but those are not crows. Those are ravens. And the collective noun for ravens is an unkindness. Now, we do have ravens in Minnesota. Uh, they are primarily in northern Minnesota, although some are creeping down into the Twin Cities metro area. Every now and then when I am birding over by Lake Vadness, uh, I hear a raven. So they are getting a stakehold here. And just to, oh yeah, I thought I'd put this in for a go. It's not really a murder of crows unless there's probable cause. Ha ha ha. I know this should be funny too, but those are all ravens. So I just want to point out in this picture, uh, look at that big chonky beak this bird has. That gigantic schnoz, that is classic raven. And look, that's a big beardy boy there. You know, look at that, look at that throat. Crows are not going to be that beardy. So, so that's one way that you can tell them apart. And then when you start to get north of the Twin Cities, I grabbed a couple of photos from the Macaulay Library from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, the photo by Henry Burton, that is an American crow. It's a very sleek bird. The beak is very sleek. Uh, and if you look at it in comparison to the raven with the photo by Matt Davis, again, chonky heavy beak like even when they're flying you can notice that beak where you may not notice it as much in a crow and speaking of flight i find it's incredibly easy much easier to tell them apart when they're flying than when they're perched uh, ravens look ki kind of stretched out they have a much longer tail and if you look at that these are screenshots of ravens and crows from the david sibley app you can see that a raven has a wedge-shaped tail and crows have a rounded tail ravens also have a, a much uh, longer wingspan and because of that ravens can fly in a different way than crows crows they're pretty much flappers they're guide gliders they might circle around but they really can't soar in a thermal the way a hawk does you know we've seen bald eagles and red-tailed hawks floating 
on a thermal, those warm currents of air and they gradually spiral upwards. Crows really don't have the proper wing shape for that. However, ravens do. And uh, that's, you'll sometimes see ravens mixed in with uh, birds of prey that are migrating up at Hawk Ridge. Uh, I actually, I have found a raven in Menominee, Wisconsin about 12 years ago and I found it because like, why is that crow soaring? And then I realized, oh wait, no, that's a raven. So those are two ways that you can tell them apart. So, and when I'm talking about the roost here, these are all American crows that are in the Minneapolis roost. There really aren't any ravens in the roost. Ravens do roost, not in the size that crows do, and they usually don't come into uh, Twin Cities metro area. So just some quick facts about crows. They're a member of the corvid family and that includes several other species, some jays and uh, ravens. Uh, I'll show some pictures of other types of corvids. Uh, crows weigh about a pound. And, and think about that. If you've seen the crow roost and you've seen all these crows in the tree and you think each bird is a pound, those are some really strong trees. We need to keep strong, healthy trees in the Twin Cities metro area. They have a wingspan about 39 inches. There can definitely be some variation. You know, uh, you, you can, crows are definitely smaller than ravens, but you can have a big chonky crow and you can have kind of a small raven, but, but uh, the, about a wingspan of 39 inches and their body length on average is 17 inches. Something I find fascinating is that the oldest crow that was ever found in the wild in banding studies was found in New York and it was over 16 years of age and it was still alive. They recaptured it, which I think both of those facts are pretty amazing because uh, crows, corvids, they're very hard birds to catch. They have great memories. So when you've trapped them and banded them, they remember the whole technique and it's not really easy to do it again. So it's amazing that they were able to recapture this crow. It was still alive and it was released. So it could still be living out there today. Now the oldest crow in captivity that is documented lived to be about 59 years of age, which is pretty amazing uh, when you think about, usually when long-lived birds, you, you think about citizens, parrots, uh, you know, a lot of seabirds uh, that eat a lot of fish, they tend to live that long. Uh, what is the albatross? Uh, Wisdom the albatross, she's over 60, and not only is she still alive, she's still laying eggs. Whew, that's exhausting. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing that an omnivore uh, was able to live to 60 years of age. These are some other types of corvids. In the larger picture here, these are some corvids that uh, I see whenever I go to Europe. We have a hooded crow and all the smaller uh, corvids around them. Those are jackdaws and they're super cute. Pretty much if you ever watch anything uh, that's produced by the BBC, you will hear these corvids in the background. They sound like our crows, only weird weirder. Um, Oh, this is a good question. Why is it amazing that an omnivore lives so long? When you read about studies of birds that live a long time, it's typically the fish eaters. And I guess in my brain, I think, well, fish is kind of healthy as opposed to, you know, crows. Uh, they're eating roadkill. Um, they're digging through our dumps, but they also will eat quite a bit of grain and insects. And they're, they're also fairly predatory. Um, Two other corvids we have on here is the blue jay. Blue jays are related to crows. And then down below, we have the Canada jay, formerly known as the gray jay, that you can see in northern Minnesota. And this is one I got a picture of up at Zaxxon Bog, uh, chowing down on a deer carcass. So uh, yeah, they, all corvids have a, have a varied diet. Uh, things that I've seen crows eat outside of roadkill, uh, I saw one eat a bat one day outside of uh, my apartment building. Uh, years ago when I worked at a wild bird feeding store, I was sitting at my desk on a quiet day and I heard this kind of eh, 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 and I thought, oh cool, Cooper's Hawk got a starling because it sounded like a starling distress call. And I opened the back door to check it out and there was a crow with a baby rabbit and it was the baby rabbit making that noise and all of us looked petrified and didn't know what to do. Uh, the crow flew off the rabbit and the rabbit ran elsewhere. I felt kind of bad for interrupting the meal, but that's what crows do. And then one day I watched crows uh, do something really gruesome. Uh, in my old neighborhood, pigeons just nested any place they could find what they thought was a stable platform. And it was a rainy day and I was working from home and I, I noticed a crow kind of picking at something on an apartment across the way from me on the roof. And so being a birder, I got my spotting scope out and I was checking it out. And then I realized it was a young pigeon and it wasn't quite dead. And the crow very slowly picked it apart and ate it. And then an hour later it came back and had another pigeon and it ended up 
completely raiding the nest of this pigeon. So uh, crows will eat a little bit of everything. Now here is a cool slide that I got from Peggy Ryden today of the crow roost. Let's see if hopefully we'll be able to hear this. So that's a little snippet of the crows kind of staging. Uh, and you know, it really doesn't do it in the, the majesty that it does. As I have tried to capture photos and videos of the crow roost, I always come home and I'm a little disappointed. It's like, but no, it's so much bigger. It is something that everybody should experience once in their life. But I like this video but because this kind of shows how it starts. Uh, the crows take their time coming into the roost at night. Uh, and the roost is, is primarily a place for them to sleep. And so they, uh, they'll kind of do what's called staging. They'll gather in one area and maybe they'll feed and maybe they'll start with a family group and then a few more family groups come in. And then before long, you have 500 crows and they're kind of going around looking for food. And then another 500 crows join them and maybe they start drinking out of the Mississippi River. So the staging can be just as fascinating as it can be to watch the actual roost. What's really fascinating is that it can take them two to three hours to finally settle down into the roost and sleep sometimes even longer. Uh, but in the morning, once they're awake, they get out of that roost fast. Uh, they, they are ready to go. So, so what is the deal with the murder? Why are the crows doing this? Well, crows get together in their murders for a couple of reasons. Uh, you lost audio. Did you lose audio of me? I'm just gonna take a quick question. If you can put in the comments, if you can hear me, it's okay if you lost audio of the crows. Whew, okay, good, you can hear me. Yay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so what is the deal with the murders? Well, it depends. Uh, crows will get together in groups for different reasons. Uh, the roost is all about sleeping and safety and numbers. Uh, but the other reason why they will get together and scream and yell is because of great horned owls. And great horned owls are probably part of the reasons <laughs> why they gather in large roosts. Uh, crows will engage in what's called mobbing. Great horned owls aren't their own target, only target, they will also go for, um, uh, they'll also go for bald eagles. I've seen them mob bald eagles. Uh, I have a young red-tailed hawk in my neighborhood who took a pot shot at a crow one day and now they mob that poor thing every time it, it casts a shadow here. And the reason why they do that is crows have incredible memories. And so once they've had an attack by something, they will mob it and drive it out of their territory. And so they're basically all screaming and yelling there, hey, owl here, owl, everybody, be, be warned and the owl has lost its element of surprise and mobbing can go on for a long time. I don't know how owls take it quite frankly, but owls aren't really going to move and so uh, they usually stay in one spot and eventually the crows do get a little bored. Now, funny thing, I had crows nest in my neighborhood this summer and I had a young crow and it loved to take over my fly through feeder in the front yard. So I kind of, I would play games with it. <laughs> And one day I started out and I just would stand out on this on the porch step and I would just stare at it. And at first it would kind of eat, but then it was like, she's just staring at me. Why is she doing that? And I, I didn't do anything. I didn't frown. I just stared at it. And then it, it couldn't take it. And it just started cawing and it was going, caw, 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 and, it, and it flew away. And so the next day it came back and this time it had two of its family group with it. And they're all out there. And the family group is kind of sitting in the tree. And then it, it sees me and it goes cock, 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 and they all go in the tree. And so I follow the, the younger crow and I just follow and it tries to adjust itself on a branch to, to hide itself in the leaves and I can adjust my position on the ground. And then the other two were like, okay, this is weird. This lady is weird. And so they all started cawing and eventually the older crows were like, okay, all she's doing is staring. She's not really a threat. We're out of here. But the, but the young crow still hangs around. <laughs> And so now if I'm going to my car, I get a little mobbed myself. So I know a little bit about what owls uh, are going through. All right, so that's one reason. So is that they mob to try and drive predators away. But the roost 
it's it's different. It's about safety and numbers. Uh, they all come together. And one of the reasons why they come together in these large groups at night is safety and numbers. Sleeping is a vulnerable activity. You're not paying attention to what's going on around you. Something could sneak up on you. And so uh, if you're one of 10,000, you're less likely to have something bad happen to you. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why crows gather in these large roosts. And great horned owls can find these roosts and great horned owls do predate them. Uh, one night the crow roost a few years ago was in Loring Park in downtown Minneapolis and I was walking around just kind of marveling at all these birds quiet in a tree and a great horned owl blasted through and took off with one of them and it sent the rookery into uh, disarray. And uh, that, so that's one of the reasons why they gather in these large groups is that they are vulnerable at night. And that's one of the reasons why they hate owls is because owls like to eat them. If you go to any great horned owl nest, you will find two things I can guarantee you'll find, pieces of skunk and pieces of crow. And if you've seen my bald eagle in a box program, there are some crow feathers in that. And the bald eagle in a box program are things that have been collected by bird banders uh, in bald eagle nests when they've done bird surveys in our corridor. So, so crows, they're smart and yeah, they eat other birds and rabbits sometimes, but quite a few things out there will eat them. So what's the deal with crows coming into the Twin Cities metro area or metro areas in general? Uh, the, Minneapolis isn't unique. Rochester has a crow roost. Uh, Pittsburgh has a crow roost. They're um, all over the country. Well, there are several theories with that. Number one, cities tend to be a few degrees warmer than uh, outer areas. Uh, the buildings absorb the heat during the day and then release it, so heat is a factor. Uh, we have uh, an endless supply of food with dumpster dumpsters out there. <laughs> I remember uh, one morning the crow roost uh, broke free from downtown Minneapolis and I lived over in Lynn Lake on Lindale and 32nd and the crows were pouring out one morning and they would come down because people would leave their dumpsters open and they're picking through trash and I was just in enjoying my coffee looking out the window and this guy comes out in his pajamas with this big bowl of ice and is futilely throwing chunks of ice into the air and I mean it's not nearly anywhere near the crows because they're high high up in a hackberry and I finally open the window I was like dude what are you doing and he's like they wake me up every morning I want them gone and I said close your dumpster and they won't be here to eat but uh, he never he ended up moving so I mean yeah so food is another reason but the interesting thing that we're finding is that crows like to roost near the light. And something that we've learned is that crow eyesight is not good in the darkness. And so if they are spooked at night and they need to flee to safety, or if one of the crows is acting as sentry and just kind of checking things out and a great horned owl is cruising in, they can see it a lot faster and warn the flock or just get the heck out of Dodge. So it, it's fascinating that they do like the light. You would think uh, sleeping around a lot of light would be uncomfortable, but it's something that the crows actually do find fairly comfortable. And, you know, we've seen this with other species. They're not corvids, but I don't know if you remember, I think it was about 10 years ago, there was birdageddon when a whole bunch of blackbirds fell from the sky in Missouri. And it was, it was a similar thing, you know, a lot of blackbirds roost similarly to crows and someone let off fireworks near a roost and it startled the birds and they ran into each other they ran into buildings they flew into the ground and so that's how that happened and there just wasn't good light around that so crows like the light Okay, so this is a really cool animated map that I'm going to animate here from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. eBird, if uh, you ever want to like, if you ever have a question about birds, Cornell uh, has you set up. But this is an abundance map of the American crow, and it's set up to do an animation of crow movement throughout the year. So this is uh, a January uh, picture of the map. And so this is all based on reports of people who use eBird and document birds and document their sightings. So if you look where it's yellow. I mean, that's where crows are sparsely dispersed. And the darker purple it gets, that means that uh, there's more of a concentration of crows. So this starts in January and it's going to animate and go all the way through December. And so we'll be able to see uh, how crows uh, move. Because when I was younger, it never occurred to me that crows migrate. So watch this. There they go up into Canada and they spread out. And then in the fall, they all come back down 
and they concentrate in the southern states. So you can see uh, along the Mississippi River up where uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa uh, are, you know, we have a bit of a cluster of crows there. We have a higher density. But look at that density down uh, around the Gulf Coast, down uh, around Texas and Louisiana. So, I mean, they have even bigger concentrations of crows there. And that'll be important. Uh, so, uh, so how do you find these roosts? Well, someone had asked earlier, like, are the roosts just getting started? They're actually going to be winding down. If you're going to go check out the roost, I would do it now because crow mating is going to kick in in March. But the roost pretty much uh, starts gathering in November. Uh, I typically think of it uh, as going from uh, Thanksgiving through early March. And uh, they're, the easiest way to find it is just follow the crows. Uh, I remember years ago coming home from work at the bird store in Bloomington and being on 35W and just watching a river of crows head towards downtown. And so when I want to find the roost, I just kind of cruise along the Mississippi River. I usually do it about two hours before sunset and you see the flocks moving and, and you know where to go. It's one of my challenges. I would love to do uh, crow roost park service programs, but I can't always guarantee exactly where they're going to be. And I don't want to uh, drive 20 people around in a caravan to try and follow them. But you can do that on your own, in your own vehicle or on a bike. And uh, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery where they will finally end up. Like I said, one night they ended up in South Minneapolis, but most of the time they end up along the river right now. So you just follow those lines of crows and they're going to take their time. They're like, when I was out watching them the other night, they were chowing down on Hackberry before they settled in. As a matter of fact, this is a video of a crow. It won't have much sound, but uh, it was uh, going for hackberries. So it, and I've seen a lot of bird species go for hackberries, robins, starlings, uh, cardinals, waxwings, crows. So if you're looking for a tree to plant in your backyard that's bird friendly, it's a pretty good one. It gets really tall though. So here's this crow, watch. not the best video ever, but I thought it was really cool to just see them going after that dainty berry. And again, think about that. That bird is a pound and there are several birds in those thin branches that that hackberry is holding up. There was one point there were so many crows uh, in the hackberry trees around me that you could hear the little branches snapping and falling like, like rain around me. So it's really kind of a cool thing. Now, something interesting too uh, is, you know, crows tend to come back to the same roost. They're very loath to give up the roost. And so so as I was researching this program, just to make sure uh, everything I had to say was still up to snuff, I found something kind of fascinating that I printed out to read. Um, large numbers of crows were killed by dynamiting the night roost during the 1920s and 30s. In a six year period from 1933 to 1939, 7,093 7, crows were shot in Illinois uh, and then 6,29,800 dynamited. Uh, and this was, and there are several uh, things like there's another one in Oklahoma where they blew up a roost that had over 26,000 crows. Uh, and so it, what they, their thinking with this was that these crows were causing waterfowl numbers to go down during this time period. And, you know, crows like to eat ducklings, they like to eat eggs. So the thinking was, well, if we just blow up all the crows in the wintertime when they're sleeping, we won't have as many crows. There was a 10 year period where they did this and uh, Oklahoma estimates that they took out 3.8 million crows and it didn't affect waterfowl production at all. And so that meant that there was something else that may have been causing uh, waterfowl numbers to go down. I don't know, maybe over hunting. But the other thing that was interesting was that the crow numbers didn't necessarily go down either. And the reason was that uh, some of the crows who were blowing up were actually the northern crows that were migrating in. So it's just really fascinating that uh, this is how we used to treat these crazy bird phenomena. <laughs> and now uh, I think that's also contributed to one of the reasons why crows roost in metro areas. Because, you know, if a farmer doesn't want a crow roost on, his, on their property, they can just, you know, blast the crows a little bit. And, you know, in the cities, 
people aren't going to shoot as crow shoot at crows as much, uh, and they're certainly not going to blast dynamite in a crow roost. Um, it's still a thing that happens. I remember years ago I went to uh, uh, a bird festival in Brinkley, Arkansas, to celebrate the ivory-billed woodpecker. They had blackbird roosts there, and there were people in the parking lot shooting all the blackbirds. And I went over to the festival organizer and I said, "Hey, FYI, this is a bird festival, and people get upset if you shoot birds at a bird festival." And the man. Uh, was standing next to the organizer and he turned out to be the mayor of Brinkley and he said, ma'am, this ain't no blackbird festival. This is a woodpecker festival. And I said, okay. Hope it goes well for you. All right, moving on. Uh, so yeah, crows are very, uh, they, they have a lot of fidelity to their roost site. They'll come back to the roost spot site year after year. The exact place of it might shift a little bit. This was a night when they were in Loring Park. Sometimes they'll be along West River Road. Sometimes they'll be on the buildings in downtown Minneapolis, but it is the same general area. All right, and here's another shot of the crow. This was the night that it was in South Minneapolis uh, in my old neighborhood. And you know, it's, it's a really fun opportunity to get some uh, photos of crows. This was a time lapse I took of the roost uh, when we had that gigantic moon last week. Of course, you know, the crows flew in front of the moon, but it was still kind of cool to get a little time lapse of that. And it's a good place to check out. So, like I said, the roost is going to break up uh, in March. That's when crows here in, in the metro area are going to start pairing up. And, you know, I think there is some pair bonding that happens in the roost, especially with young crows that don't have uh, a mate yet. You know, what better place could you go to to meet your future life partner than Loring Park, where 10,000 of you are hanging out and, and sleeping side by side. It's a good way to get to know each other. Uh, just some crow nesting facts. They can have anywhere from three to nine eggs, uh, like bald eagles. It depends on food supply. If enough food comes in, they might have nine chicks. Most likely they're going to have four or five. Um, the incubation period is about 16 to 18 days. Uh, the young crows can stay into the nest about 40 days. And something fascinating is that uh, there is cooperative nesting. So the young of the previous year will help the adults of this year raise the young. So they kind of get a year to like learn, oh, this is how you raise chicks. This is how you drive off predators. You know, wouldn't it be great if we could all get a, a, a little uh, test batch to raise kids before we start uh, laying eggs on our own? Okay, so if we have enough time, I wanted to play a fun little game where I was going to play some bird calls and I wanted you to tell me if it was a crow, a crow or no. And so I'll play the bird call and you can just type in the comments and let me know if you think if it's an American crow. So let me get the first call queued up. Oh, you guys are smart. Yes, that is a crow. So very good. So you already got a one point. Okay, so here comes the next one. Maybe. Here we go. Let's see. Ooh. There is some confusion on that one. Well, I'll tell you, uh, it is not an American crow, but that is a fish crow, which you can hear in the East Coast. Sometimes I hear them along the Gulf Coast in Texas. I've heard them in Florida. I've heard them along Lake Erie in Ohio, but that is the fish crow. And uh, it is a very common question I get sometimes when someone's been to a beach and they said, what's the bird that says, nah, -uh, nah, -uh. And uh, that is the American, that is the fish crow, which they look identical to an American crow, except they sound like they've swallowed a bit of helium. All right, I've got a couple more calls for you. Let's see, here we go. Ah! Whoa, here we go. Uh, this is, we have some, uh, some, some disagreement here, but that is a crow. That is a clicking sound. We have no idea why they make it, but that is the clicking sound of a crow, uh, the American crow. I've heard it in my backyard. I've heard it uh, along the park. 
So that is just one of the weird sounds that they will make. They will also mimic the calls of other birds. Uh, I have a crow in my neighborhood that does a juvenile red-tailed hawk. Uh, I have one that uh, I've heard do, um, uh, what is the word I'm thinking of? What's, I've, I've heard crows also do other ones. So they are good mimics. And I believe Mark, he, he had a crow as, when he was a kid. It's not legal to have a crow now, different times. But uh, I know people in the past that have had them and you they can mimic human speech. All right, so I have one more call to play you in crow or no. Let's see, hopefully I'm gonna turn down the volume. I think this is a loud one. <laughs> That's Nate. Let's see if I think it'll do it one more time. Do it one more time, buddy. All right, everybody. I will tell you that is the bird that is pictured on the slide right now. That is a crow, but it's not a crow here in the United States. That is the Cuban crow. That is the craziest sound I've ever heard a crow make in my entire life. Uh, when I was in Cuba a few years ago and at my hotel at the Bay of Pigs, that crow made that sound all day and close to roosting time. And I was just like, how are you a crow? How did that happen? I know like individual populations can, can do their own, can come up with their own communication system, but how did you get so weird? You're even weirder than the fish crow. I like that, Amelia, free jazz crow. Yeah, every time I heard that crow go off, I just, I was just giggling like crazy. All right, everyone, how long have I been talking about crows? Mm, 736. Okay, so uh, now is your time to ask me questions and I see that we have quite a few questions in the q and A. I'm going to get out of the share screen mode. Stop share. And I am going to go into the q and A. Uh, oof, 25 questions. Let's see if I'm up to snuff. Hmm. Got my tea. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Hey, Ranger Sharon, do the crows in the area recognize your face or your ranger hat? Uh, the crow in my neighborhood recognizes that I'm the weird la lady that st stares at it sometimes and then sometimes yells at me and it makes me chuckle. All right. Catherine, I read an author's crow research done in Maine or the Northeast. Do you know the name of this book? I'm wondering if it's Bernd Heinrich. He's done a lot of Corvid research and he is one of my favorite nature writers. I would check him. Um, there's another book called Mind of the Raven and it's more raven than crow, but that's also another fascinating book to read about crows. If anyone can think of uh, a crow researcher in Maine or the Northeast that's not Bernd Heinrich, uh, please uh, put that in the comments section so maybe Catherine can find out. All right. Is this a certain area for the Minneapolis crow roost? Um, generally, the area is kind of along the river just south of downtown Minneapolis. Uh, and like I said earlier, the roost kind of shifts around, but on West River Road, it's a really great time to see them uh, between 4 p.m. and sunset. Uh, but do be prepared that the, the roost moves and you may have to drive and kind of follow them around as safely as you can in your vehicle. You may find yourself at Elliott Park. Uh, Super Fridge Room. Hi, Sharon. The migratory bird law is federal, right? So our friend in Arizona who had the crow seven years is outside the law. It depends on when. So there is the migratory bird treaty and there, there are different laws with crows. And so if someone had a crow, say in the 1960s or the 1970s, that's a different time. You know, nowadays, like if you had a crow in the 80s or 90s, that technically would not have been legal without state or federal permits. But you know, um, my badge strictly means that I can I can interpret to you. I can't really enforce that law. But yeah, generally the Migratory Bird Treaty Act says that uh, we can't have native birds as pets. I, I don't recommend having any bird as pets. They They, again, it's like having a toddler that can fly and squawk. Um, Lisa says, my little dog must have had a run-in with a crow. He barks like crazy whenever he hears or sees one. Yeah, maybe that did happen to Hank. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not Hank's therapist, but yeah, maybe he did have a run-in with a crow. Let's see. 
Oh, here's Greg was asking. Yes, you are correct. Earlier when I was talking about ravens, it is an unkindness. So when you see that meme of uh, an attempted murder, you can you can be uh, pedantic like my am with your friends and say, yeah, yeah, technically that's an unkindness, an attempted unkindness. Okay, do they roost in the same tree groups every night? Um, they try to, but I mean, the roost is so huge. Uh, you know, some of them are, are going to end up, I've seen them, especially when they've been in downtown Minneapolis, that some of them do end up in trees and some of them end up on top of the buildings. So it, it really varies. It, I think it's more important that they're in the same crow area and they can hear each other. Let's see, can I describe mobbing a bit more? What are crows doing? What response do they get? So, you know, there are at least 20 different documented crow calls and there's one and it's that you hear quite a bit at the roost and it's called the assembly call and it, it, it's it's the call that you know brings them all in and it's a call that you'll also hear when they're mobbing an owl um so and what that's doing is it's like alerting everybody around hey, there's something bad here. We're going to yell at it and hopefully it'll go away, but at least it's lost its element of surprise. So they're basically just warning everybody. And the other thing is, is that other birds learn this call. And so sometimes when crows start mobbing something, blue jays will get in on the action. And sometimes you might even get chickadees uh, getting in on the action for a large predator. Uh, blue jays will sometimes use this to their advantage. Um, they have a jay call that they use uh, when they see a predator and everybody kind of ducks. Well, blue jays have kind of figured out like, oh, if I, I make that sound, everybody gets out of my way. I'm going to make that sound every time I come to a bird feeder. So blue jays also have kind of a sub agenda with that, which I kind of admire. Um, but a lot of bird species mob. It's not just crows and blue jays. I use chickadees uh, and their mobbing to help me find tiny owls. Chickadee mobbing is way more adorable than crow mobbing. Uh, they, they do that, uh, you know, we're all familiar with the chickadee dee dee. When they're mobbing something, they go dee 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 dee. And then you might hear an agitated net hatch nearby going Ehh! kind of sounding like burnt on Sesame Street. And so when you hear those sounds, that's when I'm like, okay, where is the screech owl? Where is the saw wet owl? Or uh, as Craig and I found <laughs> when we did the big sit this fall at cold water, we heard one angry chickadee. It was just one very brief angry chickadee and we ended up finding a long-eared owl at cold water. So angry birds, they see a predator, they like to warn everybody around them about it. I also noticed that they're way more animated about mobbing in the summertime, especially when they have young birds. It's almost like they're teaching them that, hey, this is a bad thing. Really, you see how I'm freaking out here? You don't ever want to get anywhere near Cooper's Hawk. All right. Will they remember individual owls or just as a species? That's a good question. Um, some research shows that uh, crows in particular can remember individual people and individual faces. Um, but, uh, you know, I know a lot of people have enough trouble just differentiating between a, 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 a barred owl and a great horned owl. So I'm not sure if a crow can necessarily tell anything beyond owl shape. It seems like there are a lot more crows than the past years. Is that true? Um, and where are they roosting? You know, I think it depends on what your definition of past years are. I feel like when I was a kid uh, in the 1970s, early 80s, that, uh, you know, it's about the same number of crows. However, about what, 10 or 15 years ago, if that's what you're thinking of, you know, we had West Nile virus blow through the United States and that took out a good chunk of the crow population and it's come back now. So I think it <clears throat> just depends on that one. All right. How many crows are in some of the murders in Minneapolis? That's a tough thing to answer. <laughs> the roost itself varies. I will say that the roost used to be close to 50,000 birds and now it seems to be closer to 20,000 birds. And crow roosts can vary in size from 500 individuals to there are some roosts on the East Coast that can get upwards of 200,000 individuals. Uh, so, you know, the birds might find different places to roost at night, but uh, I would say on average right now, the roost is at about 20,000 birds. Uh, so the majority of the crows in the Twin Cities all roost together. Yes, however, not all of those birds in our roost right now are Twin Cities crows. Cr quite a few of those crows, if you remember that animated eBird map that showed how crows come down into the United States in the wintertime, quite a few of the rows, crows in our roost are going back up into Canada for the breeding season. Favorite roosting tree? I don't know. 
Uh, I've seen them in all sorts of trees. I've seen them in conifers. I've seen them in hackberries. I've seen them in cottonwoods. I think it's whatever one uh, is the furthest away from a great horned owl. Uh, silly question. How can you befriend crows? Um, well, if you want to feed them, you can. Uh, I, I, I don't mind if crows come to my bird feeder. I purposely don't try to attract too many of them uh, because, you know, they're, they're smart. They will raid other birds' nests and I want to give, you know, the chickadees and the cardinals and the rose-breasted grosbeaks a fair chance. You can read articles about a young woman in Seattle who used to put out oodles of food for crows and they would bring back little trinkets to her uh, bird feeder. And then the crows got to be so large that the neighbors complained and she had to stop feeding birds. So, you know, feeding crows or befriending crows with great power comes great responsibility. If, if you have a bird feeder out and you toss some peanuts and some corn out here and there, they're gonna come. They'll, they'll also patrol your yard and they'll eat a lot of insects, but you don't have to bend over backwards to attract crows. Have a good size fly through, some corn, some peanuts, that's good, but don't overdo it. Don't be, don't be a weird crow person. All right. In Maine, crows gather a small number at a time, most mid to late afternoon, around four to five, and then they all take off and stream the last 20 to 30 minutes and head south. Don't know where they roost. Follow them. Follow them and find the roost. That would be my answer. Let's see. Last year near the Lake Street Marshall Bridge, I saw about 20 to 30 crows mobbing a juvenile bald eagle who was trapped on a sandbar. Every time the eagle tried to take off one or two, three of the crows would dive bomb her and stop her from taking off. This went on until later the afternoon, almost five hours. The crows eventually disappeared and the eagle took off. Have you seen this? I have seen this happen when uh, a young eagle has food that the crows want. Um, you know, the, the eagles, they have to learn how to live with crows and especially if that is uh, a young bald eagle fresh from the nest. Uh, it's, and the crows see an opportunity to harass it, they're definitely gonna do that. And you know, an eagle is a big bird. It is not nearly as agile as a crow. And it takes a lot for that bird to take off. So, you know, if it's got 20 or 30 crows dive bombing it, I don't blame it for not wanting to take off either. That'd be annoying. But uh, yeah, e eventually uh, eagles get older, more agile and crow crows learn their place. Let's see. Where do crows lay their eggs? In nests. Um, the nests can be in a variety of different places. They can be in conifers. They can be in trees or in deciduous trees. And crows are surprisingly secretive and quiet around the nest. Uh, if you see a crow being quiet and looking a little hinky, that's probably a sign that it has a nest nearby. But if you start to watch it, it is not going to go near the nest. They are very very cautious about that. Crows and blue jays are both like that. All righty. What do crow nests look like? Are they typical nests in all the same area and spread out? Yeah, it's kind of like, it's a stick nest and it's a large stick nest and uh, it's, um, it's, it's a kind of a shallow bowl shape. And the ones that I've seen the most have been in the conifers. I've seen one in a deciduous tree. And something kind of interesting is uh, Merlins, a small falcon that has moved into the Twin Cities in the last 20 years. They don't build their nest, but boy, howdy, do they love to take over an old crow nest. And they are not above killing a crow to do so. So uh, if you have crows nesting in your neighborhood, you probably will get Merlins nesting around there too. I know someone who lives near the river and throws dog food in his backyard for crows. Any problems with that? You know, as long as it's just like a handful and you know, you're not buying like a hundred pounds of dog food a week to, to, to subsidize crows, there shouldn't be any problem. I mean, neighbors will let you know if it's a problem, but there's plenty of food for crows around in the area, but no, putting, putting out a little kibble isn't a big deal. I certainly wouldn't put out a lot of kibble because on the off chance the crows don't eat it, you're gonna end up with raccoons in your backyard and raccoons carry some nasty things. Um, who among the crows determines the roost and where it will be? Is there a queen or an alpha crow? Um, there, there isn't, uh, there's a lot we don't know. I mean, <laughs> we don't know who determines the roost. It's kind of like watching a starling murmuration that kind of wheels and spins in the, the sky. Nobody understands like, what is the bird that suddenly decides that they go this direction or that direction? Um, there are definitely uh, alpha crows, I would say in family groups. Uh, I don't know enough to be able to say whether it is a, uh, 
uh, there's any kind of sexual dimorphism with that as to male and female. But as far as where the roost goes, that uh, no one knows the answer for that right now. Be a good graduate project for somebody. Why do crows mimic? It's just something corvids do. Uh, uh, you know, blue jays mimic. Uh, blue jays do a lot of different sounds. Broadwing talks. I've heard blue jays mimic crows. Uh, blue jays are also another species you can train to talk. It's just something that is part of the COVID lifestyle. COVID. Corvid lifestyle. Good, goodness, this pandemic has gone on too long. <laughs> do crows like the rain? They seem to like the rain. I've never asked them, so I don't know that for sure. Um, I would guess that if you're, uh, I do know crows like to bathe. I mean, I saw some bathing over at Caposia Landing, <laughs> right at the effluent channel of the pig's eye sewage. Uh, treatment area uh, last weekend. So, um, you know, if they're feeling dirty, it'd be like having a nice shower. Are there more crows in Minneapolis proper this year? Uh, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's the appropriate number, but I haven't done actual surveys to be able to give a good answer to that. I will say we have more crows than we did 20 years ago. And again, that's because of West Nile virus. All right. Is there a good app for bird calls? No, I wish there was. Um, <laughs> so the app that I've primarily been using tonight is the Sibley Guide to Birds. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a free app. It's an app that you have to pay for. All bird identification apps now have bird calls on them. Uh, uh, an app that I recommend for people when they're learning their birds is the Merlin ID app. And that will, uh, when it, it, it'll ask you a series of four or five questions uh, and help you come up with an identification, or it'll try to identify your bird photo. And when it brings up an ID, you can click on that species and there are songs there. Um, the Audubon app is free and it has a lot of sounds on it. Uh, the thing I do like about the Audubon app is that you can search for bird calls or search for a type of bird based on their call. I have a real tough time telling trilling birds apart so I can bring up uh, tr all birds that trill and kind of listen to them and look at them and figure out what that what I heard. If you want to learn your bird calls, uh, there's a website and I believe it's also an app called Larkwire. And they use a series of games to teach you your bird calls. And, and that's a little more fun than just listening to bird calls in the background. Um, but again, the app that I used tonight was uh, mostly the Sibley app to play those bird calls. The only exception was uh, the Cuban crow. And so I had to get a little international. And that one uh, is from an app called Zeno Canto, spelled with an X. But I don't, that one is, if you're a really hardcore person and you're like, I really want to know what a brownback solitaire sounds like in September on average, then it's your kind of website. But start with uh, the Sibley or the Merlin app. All right. The questions keep coming. Um, please talk about crows putting dead things in our bird bath, which ruins <laughs> the water for everyone. Frog entrails are gross. <laughs> I don't want to talk about dead things in your bird bath. No, <laughs> um, you know, crows and raccoons uh, uh, will wash their food. Um, and then sometimes it's not even a matter of washing it. It's a matter of softening it up. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, rabbit pieces, you know, all that fur, it's hard to swallow dry, dry fur. So uh, having it at the bird bath helps soften it up and makes it easier to uh, swallow. So yeah, it's just one of the things that comes with having a bird bath. I know there are greats people try to put over it, but you know, they're wild animals. They have absolutely no table manners and we just live in their world. <laughs> Hillary is asking, is that Jeff Goldblum? Yes, that is. I, I engage in a crafting project that's called diamond painting. And so, uh, Hillary, that is about 19,000 little plastic beads that make up Jeff Goldblum in a sunset with uh, a pterodactyl. And then right here, this is a spotted owl painting that was done by my mom, which I really like. Um, I was told that there is crossbreeding between ravens and crows. I have not read about that, so I don't know. I, you know, with birding, anything is possible, but I, I would think a raven would eat a crow sooner rather than later. All right, what time is it? Oh, it's 7.53. Okay, everybody, there are a lot of questions <laughs> here, and I'm gonna try and get through them, but I don't wanna take up everybody's time, so if people need to leave, uh, 
<laughs> you can. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you have crow questions that I don't get to, let me get into panelists and attendees. I will put my park service email in here and I will answer your questions. I will warn you, this is Friday night and uh, I'm finished working for the weekend, so I may not answer your crow questions until Monday. But thank you so much. If people need to leave, please go. Uh, uh, I'm going to stay. So if you have a question, I'm, I'm going to go through all these questions. But I, I tell you what, you know, if this goes to 830, then that's, I have a Marvel movie with my name on it I need to watch. All right. Let's see. So yeah, I'm not sure about crossbreeding ravens and crows. I mean, I don't know enough about their genetics if that's really possible. All right. Jesse, we saw an eagle in a tree surrounded by crows. They were not afraid of the eagle? No, because eagles move slow and uh, crows can move faster. That's not to say sometimes crow, a crow misjudge, misjudges an eagle and doesn't get captured, but for the most part, they're smaller and faster. Let's see, how long have they been mega roosting in Minneapolis? Well, I've only lived in Minneapolis since 1996 and uh, they've always been here since I've lived here. So I don't know before that. Uh, how long they've been here. Let's see, are crow callers effective to make connections with crows or is it harmful? You know, imagine if you uh, went to France and you just started playing uh, sounds of French people talking, uh, they probably would not understand you and think you're weird. So I think it would be the same with, with crows. Uh, you know, I know there are mobbing calls that you can play that will get birds coming in, but you know, if you use tape calls, Birds come in, they check it out, and then they're like, oh, wait, this is just the same call over and over and over again. Uh, uh, I'm out of here. Can crows be trained? Yes, they can. And there are some education corvids uh, around the country at nature centers, and they're really quite smart and intelligent. You can Google them and find some really fun videos of them. Where would I find more information on crow memories and intelligence? Um, I would look for Bernd Heinrich books. And then there's also a great book called Mind of the Raven that will also cover it with crows as well. You can also get that as an audiobook as well. Speak on the squirrel crow relationship. I don't know if I'm authorized to speak on the crow squirrel relationship. Let's see. I've noticed that they seem to hate each other like the owl and crow. Well, you know, they like the same foods. Uh, Owls or owls, crow, crows will go after baby squirrels. Squirrels will eat other birds' eggs. You know, it's, you know, that they, they, they're comp they're in competition with each other for food. But uh, yeah, that's what's going on there. Aside from West Niles, are crows vectors for other diseases dangerous to humans or dangerous to humans in other ways? No, not really. I mean, I wouldn't drop a sandwich underneath a crow roost and then pick it up off the ground and start eating it. But uh, no, no, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, salmonella, that's if you're like licking a crow. But no, they're not, the, the only way that they're dangerous to us uh, would be if let's say you decided to climb a tree and check out a crow nest and then they would dive at your head and then knock you to the ground. But we're relatively safe from crows. Did crows develop an immunity to West Nile virus? Yes. Yes, because there's no way we could give vaccination to all the crows out there. So they did, uh, they did develop an immunity. How can they all find food to eat when there are so many? Because people are messy. <laughs> we leave trash everywhere. Uh, and then they also have a hugely varied diet. Uh, I was reading a book book uh, by Donald and Lillian Stokes on bird behavior and they said that some studies show that crows will fly as far as 20 miles away from the roost in, in a day in search of food. So they're not just staying in Minneapolis proper, they are going into uh, the outer areas and, and fields. Uh, remember, as, as the crow flies, you know, when they're going back to the roost, they don't have to deal with any heavy traffic, they're just dealing with each other. How far will they travel from the roost? About 20 miles is what I've read so far. Will crows mob a person if they were threatened? Yes, they have done studies on this where uh, they have harassed crow, they put people in masks and they've harassed crows. And if you wear that mask, uh, the crow will follow you. Um, I used to know a falconer 
who had a contract to hunt crows on the ag fields at the University of Minnesota. And so a falconer, they go out with a bird of prey and you know certain birds of prey like Harris's hawks, you can train them to go chase and grab crows. And so his thing was he would drive out with his truck and then have his hawk at the window and you know the hawk would go out uh, of the truck window. Well, the crows recognized his truck. So when he started going onto campus, they would mob his truck. And then he would try to ask others of us if he if like, hey, do you wanna come out and see me fly my bird all you have to do is uh we can use your car as a decoy no i don't want my <clears throat> car to be mobbed by crows on a regular basis do groups of crows get in conflict in one another last year i watched a group of three to five crows appear to harass a family group pretty sure nesting pair and yearling yeah you know if you, from what i've read about corvids is that um they kind of like their social standing in their in their <laughs> general area but uh you know, they, they, there could be some territory battles that happen or if somebody has some good food and they're not sharing. So uh, yeah, I can see that happening. A lot of birds are like that. I saw a group of crows begin cawing and then they suddenly flew up and pooped over a guy. It looked like it was totally on purpose. Is that a common behavior? Birds pooping before or right after they take off is a common thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is a trick I use when, when leading field trips. If that we're all watching a bird and I see it poop, I will say it's gonna fly. And sure enough, it does. Uh, it's just part of the natural thing. When you go to fly, their body always releases poop. And this is true of any bird. Uh, you know, if you're watching a cardinal sit in a tree and it poops, it will fly away. You just want to lighten the load before you got to fly. Don't stand under a great blue heron when it's about to fly. It is not pretty. Are there any research studies looking at the Minneapolis roost specifically? None that I am aware of. Uh, it would be great if someone, some grad student at the University of Minnesota did that, but no, there are no formal counts or anything like that. And I think that's just because crows are, are have generally been so abundant and for uh, most of the previous century considered a pest, quite frankly. And so I don't think people bother to study them. And it's a shame because there's so much we don't know. Can I demonstrate trilling? No. <laughs> Actually, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring up a, a trill on my phone for you because <laughs> I don't have a syrinx. I only have a larynx, so I couldn't do that. But let's see. Chipping sparrows are a bird that will trill and they'll be back in April. It's one of many species that trill, but let's see, here we go. That's a trill. But uh, we have three species that come back in spring that do that. Uh, juncos make a sound similar to that. Uh, pine warblers and chipping sparrows. Uh, do the crows ever roost in St. Paul? Would no, which is weird because that's the town everybody likes to go to sleep in. But uh, no, to my knowledge, they have not been roosting in St. Paul. Uh, I may notice more crows this year than I have uh, any time now at home or out on walks more. You know, once you have your, something on your radar, you're going to notice it a lot more. Let's see, which species is the better imitator, ravens or crows? Hmm, probably ravens. Probably ravens. I've heard ravens uh, do a lot more than I've heard crows, but I guess if you train a crow well enough. Let's see, why did the West Nile virus lead to increase, increase crow population? It didn't lead to uh, an increase in the crow population. What happened was we had a decrease in the crow population when West Nile hit because it killed so many crows. It killed a lot of red-tailed hawks and great horned owls. <clears throat> and so the population went down for a few years and then the birds uh, started to get immunity to West Nile virus and their populations came back. But no, West Nile virus didn't necessarily cause uh, a population increase. I'm sorry if what I said made it sound like that. Let's see, why did, okay, we got that one. Let's see, you're gonna delete that one. Do scarecrows actually work? No, because they don't move. <laughs> I mean, you literally have to be a person standing in a field running and chasing crows or a falconer to get crows to take it seriously. But if it's not moving, uh, they, uh, they don't move. Please describe family groups and mating patterns. Anonymous, I would love to, but that would be a whole nother hour. And this program was supposed to be done <laughs> a little bit ago. So maybe we'll do that program at another time. Um, 
Let's see, why do crows dip their food in the bird bath? Again, to soften it up, especially if it's furry or dog food, they love to put dog food in a bird bath. Uh, it just makes it easier to swallow. I found a decapitated crow in the backyard. Would an owl have done that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that is definitely a uh, uh, great horned owl work. Why do crows and ravens have black feathers? I don't know, something to do with evolution. Something uh, evolution, it made it a big advantage for them to have that coloration and that's, that's just the, the way it worked out. All right, and I think I made it through all the questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you so much for asking your questions. Uh, and yes, thank you very much for your patience and you have a great weekend. And if you send me an email, remember, I am signing off for the week after this program and uh, I will answer your questions on Monday. Have a great night, everybody.